Great. Well, thank you, Crystal. Um, so I will be talking about enhancing evaluation of wildlife detection systems. Uh, my name is Nick Ferenczak. I'm a professor in the Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering Department at the University of New Mexico. Um, and like Crystal said, uh, we're working closely with NMDOT on this project. So I want to thank uh, David Hadriger, um and also Jim Hirsch at MN NMDOT and also a number of folks at New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and Arizona Department of Game and Fish um, from New Mexico, uh, Mark Watson, and then Arizona, uh, Chad Wilberger and uh, Jeff Gagnon have all been really instrumental uh, throughout this project. Okay, and I can't see the chat box when I'm sharing my screen, so if anybody has any questions or I'm not clear on anything, uh, feel free to interrupt me as I'm running through this. Okay, so uh, the objectives, there's really two objectives to this uh, research project. Uh, and I should have mentioned, thank you as well to Transet. This is a, a Transet year four project. Um, the two objectives are to uh, prevent wildlife vehicle collisions and then also improve wildlife conservation. Uh, so I'm a transportation safety guy. So most of this will be focusing on the prevention of collisions, um, but We'll speak at the end about how this uh, is an important piece in a puzzle for uh, conservation of wildlife. Uh, so I know when I started on, on this topic, um, I hadn't really thought about it before. So I imagine there's some folks in the, the audience who haven't thought about wildlife vehicle collisions before, um, but it's actually a really important uh, problem. Uh, so across the US every single year, about 200 people are killed uh, by wildlife vehicle collisions. There's tens of thousands injured, uh, considerable property damage. So I haven't seen any total estimates, uh, but the estimate for just wildlife uh, deer vehicle collisions is about one and a half million every single year across the country. So we're talking about millions of collisions all, all across the country every single year. Uh, and then also, in addition to being uh, harmful to humans and the transportation system, uh, this is also really harmful to wildlife as well. About eight and a half billion dollars in total costs from wildlife vehicle collisions every single year. Uh, this is an especially important issue in rural parts of the, the uh, country and much of New Mexico is very rural. Uh, so you can see here in this map to the right, all of those highways that are highlighted in red, at least 50% of their collisions involve wildlife. So you can see every corner of the state, and this would probably be similar for uh, other states in, in the region as well. Um, but a lot of our rural highways, this is the number one safety concern that we have for those roadways. So it's actually a really, really big issue. Uh, to mitigate these collisions, uh, the most popular approach is to provide some kind of crossing so that the wildlife never need to go onto the roadway in the first place. Uh, so we have overpasses either specifically for wildlife or that humans can use as well. Uh, and then we also have underpasses. So you can use a culvert or with this study, what we looked at is just a typical highway bridge uh, and channeling the wildlife so that they use that underpass underneath the highway bridge. So this is the kind of uh, crossing that we're going to be focusing on with this work. So there were really two objectives to this work. Uh, we first wanted to develop a detection methodology to understand what kind of wildlife is actually using these crossings. Is the wildlife using the crossings or are they just going around? Uh, so that was kind of the, one of the main parts of the first uh, phase of this study, uh, to develop this methodology. Uh, we've had the uh, monitoring equipment out in the field for about seven months now. So we've got seven months of data. Uh, so the other part of the project is to analyze that data and figure out what's going on uh, out there on our roadways. So I'll run through uh, seven months of preliminary analysis. By the time we finish the project completely and we have our implementation report, we should have 12 months so we see all the seasons. Uh, but for right now, we'll just be covering seven months of data. So a few research questions that we wanted to answer and that the DOT folks and the uh, game and fish folks all, all came up with uh, at the beginning of this project. How much game fencing is needed to effectively direct wildlife to a crossing structure? So it's not just enough to add a crossing structure. You need some kind of fencing to channel the wildlife to that structure. But there's no, or there's one piece of research out there and it gives a broad, um, recommendation of more than five kilometers of fencing 
Um, so there's not a lot of research out there looking at how much fencing is uh, effective at channeling wildlife to these structures. So we wanted to understand that. What size underpasses will elk use? So there's a lot of elk in the area that we studied. Uh, these are very large mammals and they have been shown to be hesitant to use smaller crossings. So we wanted to understand what is that threshold? Um, what, what kind of crossing will elk use? Uh, what types of rare animals use the facilities in the corridor? So th the top two are kind of safety questions. This one's more of a game and fish question. Uh, but uh, this research was, was also a piece in a larger puzzle in that um, with this detection technology, we we're better, better, better able to understand uh, kind of migration patterns and what kind of different wildlife are using these corridors uh, in this part of the state. So that was one of the bigger picture things that we wanted to understand, what kind of wildlife is using this. Uh, and then also, like I mentioned before, one of the big parts, the first phase was develop this new methodology. Okay, so onto what we actually did. Um, we were looking at a site up here in the northern part of New Mexico. So for folks that aren't familiar with New Mexico, uh, this is technically the southern end of the Rocky Mountain Range. So you could consider this location as mountainous or else high desert, uh, but all to say that there is a lot of wildlife using uh, this area. And if you remember back to that first map, there were a lot of red highways up here. So a lot of wildlife vehicle collisions happening in the northern part of the state. Uh, so we were monitoring two different crossings on US 64 uh, west of Chama, New Mexico. Uh, and there was game fencing installed in this uh, game fencing installed in this area in 2012. Uh, it was installed because there are a lot of collisions occurring here. And the reason for that is that to the southeast, we have mountainous terrain. So there are steep cliffs. Wildlife aren't going to use those cliffs. Um, they're going to channel down here to this area and cross right here. Uh, up to the northwest, we have uh, sagebrush flats. So it's much more flat. Uh, you can see wildlife it's, if it's approaching the road, so much better visibility. But in this area, we had a lot of topography. You can see the creek right here. Uh, so a lot of topography, not much visibility, and we've got that wildlife channeling down to this corridor. Um, so they installed wildlife fencing to channel the wildlife to two different bridges. Uh, both of these bridges uh, have Amargo Creek that you can see here on the west side of the mountains. Amargo Creek runs underneath these bridges. Um, and we have a smaller bridge up to the north and a larger bridge down to the south. So this is what these bridges look like. Uh, the smaller bridge is here on the left, about 20 feet of vertical clearance here. And that's 9387. And then the larger bridge that was to the south, 9415, we've got about 40 feet of vertical clearance. So those are the two. Um, two bridges that we're going to be monitoring. Okay, so to monitor, we installed cameras out in the field. There was nothing to install the cameras to underneath the bridges. Uh, so we installed our own poles. Uh, the poles were 12 feet long. It's tough to get into our car, but we got them up there. Um, 12 feet long with a two foot concrete footer. So 10 foot of exposed pole. Uh, the pole is steel, schedule 40, two and a half inch diameter. Uh, we installed one pole in the smaller bridge to the north. Uh, and this is an important part of the, the project because we wanted to understand passage rates. So we wanted to understand how many animals are actually approaching the bridge and then how many actually use the bridge uh, versus how many approach and then just run away because it's too small and they don't feel uh, safe using that, that crossing. So we wanted to make sure that we have each approach uh, monitored so we know how many are actually moving through this crossing. Uh, so we had about, I think, 40 feet or so width here. Uh, there's riprap and steep slopes on either side. So we really only had 40 feet that, that wildlife would cross. So we installed one pole right in the middle, with four cameras facing in each direction, and we could pick up uh, any movements that were uh, happening around that bridge. Uh, this is what the installation looked like. So our pole and our cameras on there. And again, I want to thank the Game and Fish folks and the DOT folks. Everyone came out the day of installation and, and helped us out. So it was a pretty fun day. Um, so this is the larger uh, bridge to the south. For this bridge, the creek runs on the southern end, but you can see here that there's really steep slopes with buttresses. 
holding up the slopes. So, and also there was uh, cattle fencing here. So there were no wildlife crossings to the southern end. Also, there's a large riprap field in the middle. So most of the wildlife was crossing up on the northern end. So we installed one more pole up on the northern end, two cameras to get both mo movements. Uh, but then we also wanted to see what kind of wildlife was moving down the creek here. Uh, we saw quite a bit of wildlife moving down the creek and then over and crossing this way. And another picture of that installation. Uh, so we had two poles and then one of the installations was actually uh, installed onto a pier. Uh, that's what one of the poles looked like and the other pole only had one camera facing north. And then we had our pier installation. You can see the creek uh, in the background there. Uh, so we're monitoring those creek movements. Okay, so onto the actual hookup here, um, there are three parts. Uh, we had our wildlife camera. The camera was put into an enclosure that was provided by the manufacturer and that was locked. And then we fabricated, designed and fabricated these brackets that were attached to the pole. Uh, so the great part of these brackets is that they allow for horizontal and vertical pivoting so we can get um, the, the camera's position exactly where we want to. Uh, so for this vertical pivot, uh, there's actually a big bolt here and two nuts on that bolt. So the inside nut, you can loosen up and then you can pivot it where you want to and then tighten that nut again. And the outside nut is actually welded to the bolt to prevent theft or vandalism. So you cannot take that bolt off. There's no way you can remove this thing and vandalize it. Same thing for the horizontal pivot. So you can loosen that nut there, you can pivot it and then tighten it again. Uh, but this one actually has a padlock. So you, if you have a key, you can remove that padlock, slide that bolt out, and then you can remove, uh, remove the, the bracket. And the reason for that is that uh, to install this whole thing to the pole, uh, we needed to put bolts inside the bracket right here. So to access those, you actually need this key, remove that bolt, take the rest of the bracket off. Uh, so it's a bit clunky, but we needed it to be uh, vandalism and theft proof. We needed it to pivot and it needs to really stand some pretty tough conditions. Uh, so that's the, the design that we came up with. Uh, we used Reconyx uh, cameras. They have a range of approximately 40 feet. Uh, we used infrared flash so that we didn't scare the wildlife at night. Uh, we take three pictures every time we detect wildlife. Uh, it needs to detect both movement and a change in heat, uh, a change in temperature. Uh, we use lithium batteries, so it's been installed for seven months and um, the batteries are still at 100%. Uh, so, okay, on to the outcomes. You get to see some fun wildlife pictures. So we've got some elk and coyote. Um, Everybody loves seeing wildlife pictures. I'm kind of sick of them because we got 100,000 pictures over seven months. Uh, we installed it in November through June, checked the uh, setup every six weeks just to make sure everything was still working. I uh, got about 100,000 pictures that accounted for 1,500 different animals using these crossings. Uh, important part of this is that we figure out how many animals are actually approaching and then how many actually use the passage. And you can see for deer and elk, our passage rates, both for the smaller bridge and the larger bridge are right around 85 to 90%. So that tells us that um, both deer and elk, the largest mammals that we encountered, uh, are, are using both sized bridges at about the same rate. So that was, that was good. Uh, we also are getting a better understanding of what wildlife is using these uh, crossings. So we picked up bobcats and um, fox at the smaller bridge. We picked up a bunch of coyote at the larger bridge, uh, but a better understanding of exactly what's going on out there. Uh, we can get a better understanding of timing. So you can see deer and orange. We have this peak early in the evening and then the elk have a peak a little bit later in the evening. Uh, so we're getting a better understanding of exactly when the, the wildlife is moving through here. Uh, other wildlife that we picked up, you can see a bit, little bit better distributed throughout the day. Uh, when are different wildlife using these corridors? You can see that when we installed in uh, November, a lot of deer were using the corridor, pretty much exactly when the deer stopped uh, showing up. That's when elk started showing up and we got two or three months of a lot of elk Then they stopped and we got a lot of deer. Uh, you can see down here, we kept on getting elk at the larger bridge and that's because of these guys right here. We had a three baby elk and they're 
uh, mama elk uh, that kept on walking through this corridor throughout the spring. So that was pretty, pretty exciting to see. Uh, we can monitor when the um, when male elk and deer are moving through. Uh, we can see that we have more southbound early in the winter, more northbound trips later in the winter. Uh, okay, and then actually looking at how this has impacted wildlife vehicle collisions, uh, we can see that after installation here in red, we've only had one collision on this corridor post installation compared to 10, 15 or so uh, before installation. And importantly, um, elk in blue, about 50% were elk before, uh, we've eliminated all those elk collisions which are the most damaging. Uh, of note, uh, that one collision on this corridor uh, was right in the middle here, um, but we also had three collisions at the termini of this corridor. So the crossing is right about here, and we had two collisions up here, crossings right about here, and we had one collision right there. So that was one of our research questions. Do we have enough fencing? Uh, it looks like we might need to think about some kind of signage or something like that at the ends of these fencing, uh, because we've gotten some collisions there. Uh, so that's uh, mostly this project. Just to, to wrap it up, uh, a few things about the bigger picture, uh, what role this plays in some other projects. Um, so NMDOT has been working with Arizona Department of Game and Fish for a few years now. They're monitoring, I think, four other sites. Uh, we're the fifth site, uh, and they're taking that project into phase two now. So again, this is one piece of a much larger puzzle. Uh, Multi-state pooled fund that NMDOT is a part of, a number of different western states. So getting a better picture of what's happening in the entire region. And then uh, New Mexico Wildlife Corridors Act also just passed uh, and NMDOT has been tasked with ensuring uh, the safe migration of wildlife. So um, this project plays a, a role in all of these larger projects. So thank you all for your attention. I think we might have a, a minute for question. Sure, we can do a couple minutes of Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, we can always come back at the end, assuming we have some time left over. So as I'm not seeing any questions pop up, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next presentation.